All right. Yes. They don't really worry about it. So I know like it doesn't really matter, but do right. you have some sort of process for making up names? Um, I thought I went over this. Um, I, I, um, I, use, uh, I use usually linguistic um, cues. Um, I've taken some linguistics courses, and so I will build a, the linguistics, base linguistics of, uh, of a region. Uh, for instance, I'll say, okay, I want to have lots of, um, lots of S sounds for what those names give. They're, you know, an S is, can be almost a sinister thing, um, and, but it's very smooth and whatnot. Or, you know, I want to use lots of glottal stops and whatnot, um, which to us, you know, usually means um, very um, uh, kind of more of a, a blunt, straightforward culture because of the way it is in our world. Uh, and you'll, you'll notice the way we interact with English affects the way we view language. For instance, uh, one thing to look at is English has a, two huge influences, Latinate and Germanic. And the Germanic sounds tend to be, um, and the Germanic words tend to be very more simple base words for us. For whatever reason, I'm sure the linguist can dig deep into this. And then we'll usually have a Latinate version that is more ornate and flowery. And this might be because of the whole, um, the whole Normandy thing, Normans thing, where they came in and they were the upper class. And so the, the, the Latinate language, the, the French-based language, was what the upper crust used. And so they had all their words for it. And then the dramatic influence was, what, was of the, the people. Is that what you were going to say? It's prob probably that from back in the 1300s. But for whatever reason, um, you will have you know, the, the Germanic way of saying something be give up, and then the French, uh, the Latinate way being to retreat. And one has a certain sense to us, and one doesn't. A lot, of our, a lot of our words, and I'll get some of these wrong, but a lot of our Germanic words are things like food and you know, work and you know, all of these words. There's a good chance if it's a, like a, a short word that means something very concrete, it's Germanic in our language. And if it's a concept, it's usually Latinate. And so you can build on that with the sounds you use um, in order to build your cultures. That's one of the things. Um, and so linguistic tropes. Usually I like to pick some either a region of our world that I'm basing off of, and it depends on how translucent I want to be. Uh, for instance, um, in Mistborn, I intentionally built an Earth analog, meaning I wanted the culture and the, um, the, 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 the technology to have, a, to have happened in basically Earth-style ways. And so the culture is going to feel very familiar because it's, it's you know, Luthadel is based on 1800s um, um, Paris. And um, you have the languages, therefore, you know, the, the, um, the area where Ellen's from is just basically using German. I went and I, I took German words and I looked for, for morphemes in them that sounded cool to me and I built names out of them. Um, because of that, a lot of the names for people from that region are actually words in German. Straf, um, Ellen's father, is a, a German word. So is Ellen, I found out later on. Um, whereas, you know, the central dominance is French, and so you have names like Vin and Demo um, and Renault and uh, Kelsier um, and things like this. Um, and so that's, you know, and then there's Spanish out the other way. And that was just uh, because it was an Earth analog. For Way of Kings, I was not using an Earth analog uh, for most of my cultures. And so instead, I was building linguistic, um, interesting linguistic concepts. And so I built a lot of the names to be um, palindromes because of you know, symmetry being holy. Uh, in Warbreaker, I did this with uh, something different. I just felt like I liked the idea of re repeated consonant sounds. It was interesting. It's a linguistic. It's a fun linguistic thing, and so you end up with Sesebron and Vivina um, and Cesirina and things like that as the names where they're just they they use the repeated vowel consonant sounds, um, just so there's a something tying them all together. I'll usually write out a list of forbidden sounds they just don't have in that language, and maybe a couple of of sounds we don't have in our language that they use, um, and so and, and I'll go from there. But using Earth analogs, I do it a lot um, because it, it, it allows us to reference what's, you know, some of the built-in things from our world. So uh, one way to do this easily is to get a, get a, um, get a, a big atlas and look for a lot of words and names. Another one is baby names from those countries and things like that. So. 
Um, it really just depends. Uh, I try to keep them subtle. I try to keep them simple. Uh, for instance, the, the terrace dialogue in Mistborn is really only three or four um, little rules for myself. Um, in their original language, they, would have, they had a word that meant, you, um, um, I think, uh, to soften. We do this a lot. We don't have them as much in English, except Canadian English just uses A um, and things like this. But a lot of languages have it. Uh, Spanish has one, doesn't, they? doesn't it? Um, what's that? Verdad. Maybe, yeah. There you go. Verdad. Um, um, but uh, I, I, so the terrorist people will say at the end, they'll often reverse that structure and just say, I think. Instead of, I think that there's, you know, they'll say, it is this and this and this, I think. Um, and that's one thing that they do. I, I built them to have um, complex, compound sentences more often than simple sentences. Um, and this is to kind of reflect their, uh, their nature as, uh, as a lot of scholars. Um, and things like this, and just a couple of little linguistic rules like that uh, to help me along and to not go overboard. I think dialect's too easy to go overboard on. Um, in Elantris, it was, it was just a couple of words from the, um, from the language that I threw in, Sule um, and Kolo and a couple of these things to just add some flavor to it. Um, so again, I, I suggest going, being more subtle and there, there are a few tricks that authors use a little too often, I feel. Um, they still can work just fine, but the no contractions thing, a lot of authors you'll see and a lot of newer writers are like, well, I'll make them use no contractions to be their, their thing. Um, and that's okay, but I would rather you say no contractions plus, you know, we have a very formal way of speaking, so we always address someone by their name. Um, or their full name, which was something Robert Jordan did. Yeah, the, the Aiel always address people by their full name. Um, very rarely do they not use the full name because that's the, one of the things he wanted for that culture. And something like that is actually more distinctive. It's also less, a, a little more invisible, and yet at the same time gives a great sense for the language. And so if you want someone to be smart, the other one that people use too often is using big words. Smart people don't actually use big words all that often. This is, a, this is a, a, a false sort of sense that we've gotten from media that the smart one is using all these big words. It doesn't happen. Go listen to smart people, and that's not what they do. Smart people tend to be much better at making arguments. They tend to be much more self-assured, and they tend to use compla complex compound sentences and arrange their, their um, sentences like I just did, where it's organized very thoughtfully. Um, People who are not educated are not going to organize their thoughts thought, um, thoughtfully in a, in, a, in a structure. They're going to kind of be more all over the place. Uh, you can also talk about instinct versus learning and how people talk. Um, whether you know, they're talking about their gut or whether they're referencing something they, they, they know because you know, they know somebody who talked about this once and things like that. That is what, how intelligent people talk. Listen to how your professors talk. Listen to how your friends talk because we are all educated. Um, and that's what we're really talking about, is someone who's educated. The other thing that really intelligent people do, if they're hyper-intelligent in our society, if you talk to them, pop culture references um, are just, you know, the, the, the way they talk is back and forth really fast, referencing obscure things. Um, they don't use big words. They reference an episode of The Simpsons that they know another hyper-intelligent person will know and laugh at, and everyone else will be like, what? Or they'll make a really, really witty pun that'll make them smile. This is what it was like hanging out with Ken um, Jennings, um, uh, my roommate. Uh, you, you know that guy's not that, right? Yeah, my roommate. Uh, when I lived with Ken um, and his brother Nathan and um, uh, our pal Earl, um, those three were all on College Bowl together. Um, well, Ken and, um, and Earl were, and, and I don't think Nathan was with them, but they were all, they're all trivia buffs. They're all hyper-intelligent, and a conversation between the three of them is not full of big words. Instead, it's full of the right words. It's full of lots of quick back and forth. And it's, full, it, it's over your head because you don't know what they're referencing half the time. So that's what hi, how hyper-intelligent people get. So anyway, those are just a couple of, um, of thing, mistakes people make. Um, instead of having them you know, use words like miasmic and um, and, and you know, these big, long sentences with these, you, you've seen it. They do it. They do it in kids' cartoons all the time. Well, that's the smart one, because he just used a word I don't know. So. <laughs>